Hello everyone and welcome to Fermilab's Family Open House. My name is Kathy Clarkin and I'll be moderating this event as Tara Hohoff teaches us about bats in Illinois and around Fermilab. Tara is a bat biologist at the Illinois Natural History Survey. I work in the education office or the Office of Education and Public Engagement at Fermilab. We'll have your cameras and voices turned off, but we'll be watching chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them there. I'll present your questions to Tara at the end of her talk. So be sure to stick around for some discussion. Now let's explore the bats of Illinois and around Fermilab. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about bats in Illinois and our project at Fermilab. So um, I will give a short introduction to myself and give you some information about bats and talk a little bit about our program, the Illinois Bat Conservation Program, talk about the project that we did at Fermilab, and then discuss what you can do for your local bats. So I am the project coordinator and co-PI for the Illinois Bat Conservation Program. And I'm also the associate mammologist for the Urban Biotic Assessment Program. Um, so this means I work with the Illinois Tollway System and I make sure that they're not gonna impact threatened or endangered species in their work. So I wanted to talk a bit about the benefits of bats and I wanted to highlight the bats that we have here in Illinois. So here in the state, we only have insectivores, so they only eat insects. And we like to think about the fact that bats eat nuisance pests like mosquitoes. Um, we don't quite know how bats eating mosquitoes may control their populations, but we do know that bats eat mosquitoes and we know that they will shift their foraging to be in areas where there's higher mosquito abundance. Probably more important here in Illinois is that bats eat agricultural pests. So an estimate was given that the value to the global corn industry is roughly about a billion dollars per year that bats provide in insect control for farmers. So they would have to spend a lot more money if bats weren't around um, picking insects off their crops. But I do want to highlight that not all bat species will use agricultural fields. Um, some may actually fly over and pick uh, insects off. And then there's some species that will use the edges of agricultural fields. And then there's some species that are gonna avoid agricultural fields altogether. So why are we worried about bats right now? Well, there's quite a few threats to bat populations, but one of the biggest ones, especially here in the Eastern United States, is white nose syndrome. So this is a cold loving fungus that arrived in the United States in the winter of 2006, 2007. And it grows over the nose and wings of the bats during hibernation. And it causes them to wake up out of hibernation and they end up burning through their fat stores. And in the winter, there's no insects available. And so they end up not making it through the winter. This has already killed millions of bats in the United States, and it's still um, moving on. So this is a map of white nose syndrome occurrence records. So it was confirmed here in Illinois in 2013. And we know that bats are probably moving this from hibernacula sites, but the cases in Washington State and California have really solidified that we know there is some human movement of this fungus also. So it could be that people are wearing hiking boots or using caving gear in caves out east and then they bring that gear out west. So a lot of caves out west will have signs or require you to actually clean your boots before you can enter their caves. So this is something that a lot of researchers are putting a lot of time and effort into trying to protect our bats. And one of the complications, so this impacts hibernating bats. And 
you know, they're in caves and cave ecosystems are extremely sensitive. So we don't necessarily want to just spray a bunch of fungicide into a cave because that could impact other parts of the community. The other kind of new threat to bat populations is the increased use of wind turbines. For some reason, it seems like bats are actually attracted to wind turbines. And this seems to disproportionately impact migratory species. So in the winter, especially you know around Illinois, it's way too cold for bats to be hanging out. So most will either hibernate, so they'll go up to Wisconsin where there's caves or down to southern Illinois where there's caves and they'll hibernate for the winter. The other option is they take off for the southern United States or even Mexico or South America to spend the winter. And these wind turbines, if they're along those migratory routes, it seems to have an impact on bat populations. So I never want anyone to think that wind energy is a bad thing. It's not. You know, most of our energy sources have some sort of environmental cost. And this is one that we're just still trying to figure out. Bat biologists are working with, um, you know, energy companies to figure out different wind speeds, um, different times to have them on. And even before they are installed to do bat surveys ahead of time and make sure that they're not along these migratory routes. So I felt like, you know, for a virtual open house because of COVID, I couldn't just completely breeze over, um, you know, in the beginning of this pandemic, there was a lot of chatter about the potential that this coronavirus came from bats. And as far as this article was in Nature in November of 2020, you know, we still don't know the source of this particular strain of coronavirus. What we do know is that horseshoe bats in China do tend to have coronaviruses. Um, and what we know of those is it's about 96.2% identical in the genetic sequence to the current COVID-19. Although 96% seems really similar, we know that humans and chimpanzees, their DNA is about 96% alike. So we know that there can be a lot of differences even with a 96% um, similarity. So the program that I work for is called the Illinois Bat Conservation Program, and it was established to fill knowledge gaps about bats in Illinois. So there's a lot that we don't know still about bats, and we wanted to better understand species distribution patterns, seasonal movement. Um, we wanted to identify maternity colonies. So a lot of our species here in Illinois in the summer, the females will create these large groups and it's the pregnant and lactating females kind of band together and the males are off on their own. Um, and then we also wanted to understand the difference in genetics after white nose syndrome. And then we also wanted to better understand bat diet preferences. So in order to you know, fill all these knowledge gaps, we have to use a lot of different methods. So we do emergence counts, mist netting, radio telemetry, guano collection and metabarcoding, and then we also collect a lot of acoustic data. And for the acoustic data, we follow the North American Bat Monitoring Program that is kind of led by the USGS. If you want to see our NA bat data, you can go on our website, illinoisbats.org. You can kind of filter the data and see um, where we're picking up bats around the state. So what do we think we could find at Fermilab? This is a list of about eight species that we would think we could find at Fermilab. And the only federally listed species that we have in the area is the northern long-eared bat, so it's federally threatened. And then these bottom three species are the hibernating species. So we have the tricolored bat, little brown bat, and northern long-eared bat. So these have all been pretty hard hit by white-nose syndrome. And because of that, 
the tricolored bat and little brown bat are actually now being considered for federal listing and the northern long-eared bat is actually being considered as an updated um, to move them up to endangered. The other couple species here are migratory. So the, east, the hoary bat, the eastern red bat, the silver-haired bat, and then the evening bat, we actually are not quite sure what they do, but we know that we don't see them in caves. So we assume that they're migratory. And then the big brown bat, actually, a lot of times they'll find themselves in people's attics. They're very adapted to human development, but they will go into caves and hibernate, but they tend to be closer to the entrance because they're a little bigger and they can tolerate the temperature fluctuations a bit more. And they also seem to be somewhat immune to white nose syndrome. They don't quite have the same impact on their population. And so we're not sure if that's genetic or something behavioral that because they're um, closer to the entrances, maybe they're not as highly impacted. So I wanted to quickly show some of our capture data for the Illinois Bat Conservation Program, just to give you kind of an idea of the rarity or not of some of these species. So the big brown bat and eastern red bat, we're still catching at a pretty high rate. So these numbers are adjusted for the amount of survey effort that we put in. The silver-haired bat actually migrates further north for the summer. So we would expect to see it in the spring and fall, but it's kind of unlikely for us to catch it during the summer months. The hoary bat is the largest bat that we have in Illinois, and so it actually flies higher than our mist nets pretty often. So we're not likely to catch them in a mist net. And then the southeastern bat is actually really only found down in southern Illinois. So again, our capture rates aren't very high for those guys. The evening bat, I'm kind of skipping a few columns over, it just isn't very common in Illinois. It's a regular resident, but we don't usually catch it very often historically, even before white nose syndrome or, you know, any of these impacts to bat populations. So then we can see, you know, the really no low numbers are the little brown bat, northern long-eared bat, Indiana bat, and evening bat. So around the state we can find the Indiana bat. They're just not likely up in the Chicagoland area, um, and they are listed as federally endangered. So for me, when I look at our numbers, the species I'm most concerned about are the little brown bat and the northern long-eared bat. So when we were approached to do some bat surveys at Fermilab, we had a few project objectives. So one of them was to identify bat species that are using Fermilab property. And, you know, we know there's a lot of various types of habitat there. So we wanted to look at bat habitat selection by looking at different activity patterns across the landscape. And we also wanted to establish a baseline of data for comparison in the future. As bats do start to recover from white nose syndrome, you know, we might start to see some increases in populations or if there's projects at Fermilab, maybe we'll see some different changes to the bat numbers that we find. Um, and I forgot to mention earlier with white nose syndrome that you know, most bats typically have one or two pups per year. So they actually have a really slow reproductive rate. So it is gonna take quite a long time for them to recover from things like a 95% decline in population. So again, we used mist netting. This is where we're actually catching bats in hand. And we use a really fine netting that you can see in the image here. And we typically are gonna use these nets in flight corridors. So bats are using echolocation and they have good eyesight. So we really have to trick the bats into going into the net. We typically have pretty low success rate, especially post white nose syndrome when there's just less bats on the landscape. We're not, you know, catching a lot of bats. And, you know, it also has a really limited habitat type that we can use this in, you know, because we need to have these forested corridors to funnel the bats in, 
you know, it's hard for us to analyze how bats are using grasslands or, you know, more open areas. But the big plus with, you know, having a bat in hand is that we're really confident in the species identification. So we know for sure that this species is using this property. So we typically use at least two double stacked mist nets. I like to put them kind of close to each other because bats will fly up and over the first one and they're not expecting the second one and get caught. We typically do two survey nights per location and we open the nets at sunset and we observe them for five hours and we're checking the nets every 10 minutes. We, when we catch a bat, we take the data that we need and then we try to release them as soon as we can. With the acoustics, we are actually able to use these ultrasonic recorders to record free-flying bats and collect their echolocation calls. Um, the image on the bottom is a big brown bat. This is a great call file. There's not a lot of noise, and we have these really distinct echolocation call pulses. We tend to have really high success rates with acoustics. We pick up acoustics almost every single place that we put out an acoustic recorder, especially in the summer. But we do have a little bit lower confidence in our species IDs. So bats use echolocation as a tool to navigate their environment and to catch prey. So if bats are using the same habitat and they're looking for the similar prey, then they're gonna have really similar echolocation calls. So there's some species that are more difficult to tell apart than others. Also, some of the higher frequency bats are harder to pick up because the sound doesn't travel as far in the environment as a low frequency sound. So when we collect lots of data like we do at Fermilab, um, it's not really realistic that we can look through every single file that we will um, record. So we use software programs to help us and we typically use Kaleidoscope or Sonabat and those are kind of the two major programs on the market and with each file it's looking at different call pulse parameters. So a lot of times when people hear acoustics they think that we're listening to these calls but we actually are generally looking at the spectrogram and looking at the call files. So in this image you can see the numbers at the bottom. This program is getting a lot of the different parameters like the high frequency, low frequency, slope of the call, and it does a multivariate analysis to try to figure out which species it thinks it is, and it usually is based on multiple call pulses. But we still do some manual review of the files just to validate um, that the species is correct. Unless we have a ton of detections, then most likely it's, it's accurate. Um, but, you know, the human eye is still better at pattern recognition than computers. So that's really cool. Um, we're still better at something. So what did we do at Fermilab? In 2017, we missed that at one site. Um, I think that was Big Woods was the first one. And we did acoustics at four sites in the summer. Then in 2018 and 2019, we actually started collecting data during the migration seasons. So in the spring and fall to see what bats were passing through at those times of the year. And we also started doing a little bit of sampling at the site 50 site. So within Fermilab, there's a lot of diversity of habitat, and we tried to capture that with our acoustics, putting the recorders up in a lot of different areas of the property. The Site 50 site was pretty unique. This opportunity just kind of came up while we happened to be on site. There was some evidence of bats using this old structure. And so we put some recorders outside of this old house. So our mist net data, as I said, you know, we typically don't catch a lot of bats. So in 2017, we actually didn't catch anything, which is a bummer. And then in 2018 and 2019, we actually caught quite a few. So we caught a big brown, eastern red, and hoary bat. 
And then the J means we caught juveniles and the L is for a lactating vet that we caught. So this picture is a big brown. This is one that we caught at Fermilab. And then this is the Eastern red bat. So you can see the really neat coloring that this species has. And the reason that they have this coloring is they actually try to look like a leaf when they're roosting. So they kind of pick a cluster of leaves and they hang by one leg so it looks like they're just another leaf in the cluster. So for the acoustics, we collected 200,000 plus acoustic files. So some of those are just noise or, um, you know, wind over the microphone or insects. Um, but a lot of those are bats, so that's really neat. A lot of data. We did have high activity for the big brown, hoary, and silver-haired bats. So these larger species tend to prefer more open habitat, and we're actually able to pick them up easier when there's a lot of trees around. Um, you're not going to have as far of a detection distance. And then the silver-haired bats are likely migrating through in higher numbers during the spring and fall. And then this image I wanted to quickly say, um, we hold their wings out like this so that we can look at one of the joints in the bones in their wing. And that if it's um, matured, it the joint has solidified and that indicates that this is an adult. It's out of the first year. And if it's not quite fused, then we know that that's a juvenile bat. So we had low activity for the eastern red, little brown, evening, and tricolored bats. And then the highest species count was at the Village Woods West site in the fall with seven of 10 potential species. So I want to show you guys some data, but we have a lot of data. So I'll try to kind of linger on this slide for a while so you can look at it. But this is activity per night. So we have the recorders out for, let's say, 10 nights. We count up, you know, on the software program, how many big brown files we have. And then we divide that by 10 survey nights so that we can account for a different survey effort. So this is we call this activity per night. And you can see there's a lot of variation. This is the spring data. So we only had that in 2018, 2019. And I color coded, started color coding some of the sites so that you know we could look at how activity was different per site. And I used green as the kind of more dense forest habitat and then gray as more open savanna, and then the yellow is more edge or um, prairie habitat. So we can see in the spring, in the spring bats are doing kind of different stuff than usual, um, but we had really high hoary bat activity, pretty high big brown activity. If you look, you can see that the numbers on the axes are different, so it's a flexible axis. And you know, we big browns, we had really high numbers, but the silver haired also came through in really high numbers, um, especially at owls nest woods. So this is the summer data. Um, this is usually when bats are kind of picking their habitat that there is more expected of them. So kind of some of these more open areas is where we find the hoary bat, um, kind of the bigger bat. And then the woods are where we expect to find the little brown and some of the smaller bats. They're less likely to go out in more open areas. And then this is the fall data. So um, we didn't pick up a ton of data in the fall in either year, but definitely 2019 had a lot more activity. And we saw this in the other seasons too. And maybe this is that some of these bat species are recovering or potentially maybe some of the species that aren't impacted by white nose syndrome are increasing because there's a lot more resources available to them. So I wanted to show the map one more time. And I think the reason we had so many species at the Village Woods West site 
is it is you know a forested patch with some edge habitat and then also that connects to a much larger connected forest outside of Fermilab. So I think that attracts some of those forest dwelling species to have that connected um, forest. And then if you're more of a map visual person, um, this is the maps for spring, summer, and fall, and the species count that we had at each of the sites. So, you know, it's interesting to see how the they are different during different seasons. So we can conclude that, you know, bats are prioritizing different habitat at Fermilab during different seasons. The little browns seem to prefer the more open woodlands in the fall and the more dense woodlands in the summer. Highest species count at village woods near that more connected forest. And these old structures on the property may be really good roosting habitats for some of our local bats. And then the juvenile and lactating bats caught during mist netting indicate that bats are reproducing locally, which is really cool um, because that means there's good enough habitat for reproduction. Okay, so now I'm going to do what you can do for your local bats. So a lot of these are really geared towards people with backyards, so I apologize if you don't, but planting a diversity of native plants and attracting moths is really great because most likely bats eat a lot of moths because they're out at night and they're a little more juicy than a mosquito. And you can Google moth friendly gardens and get lots of different ideas of species of plants that are good for this. But usually pale or white flowers with a night scent are good for moths. Providing water sources is good for lots of wildlife. Bats will fly down and skim the water to take a drink, usually when they first wake up in the evening. But if you do have a pool, it's a good idea to either cover your pool at night. Bats do tend to get stuck in pools and other wildlife get stuck too. So if you can't cover your pool, you can also get one of these wildlife ramps. They sell them almost everywhere but it just kind of helps bats to, or other wildlife to get out because those steep sides of the pool are really hard for animals to get out. Um, reducing your dependence on pesticides and herbicides. This helps, you know, with bats. Bats actually are pretty long lived for how small they are. They can live you know, 10 to 15 years and the oldest recorded bats globally are 30, 40 years old. So because they're so small, all those toxins can really build up in their bodies. Um, and then, you know, if we're using pesticides to get rid of all the insects, then the bats don't have anything to eat. And then this, you know, is something that a lot, a lot of people like to hear, but keeping your cats indoors is really best for wildlife, especially at night for bats. Um, domestic cats have a huge impact on wildlife, and we have lots of data to back this up. Um, if you can't resist letting your cat outside, then there are times that you can, um, you know, if you could keep them inside it would be best. And that includes dawn and dusk help with bird fatalities and at nighttime keeping your cats indoors can help with bat fatalities. You can also put up a bat house. Um, this generally isn't the first thing that I suggest to people. I think some of those other ideas are better for bats. Um, but bat houses are a good option and you can either buy one or build one. And there's lots of different styles now. And I did want to say this image has a bat house flush on someone's house. And we typically don't recommend that actually because, you know, if it gets full and it's looking for somewhere else, they'll might end up in your house. And also this can cause lots of staining on the side of your house or barn. 
I highly recommend if you're interested in bat houses to look at Bat Conservation International's website. They've really put a lot of effort into creating good resources there. But generally you want to put a bat house along a tree line. You wanna make sure there's plenty of room um, underneath for the bats to easily enter and exit. Bats actually aren't great at taking off from the ground. That's why they hang upside down. So they need some space to kind of get into flight. They generally need at least six hours of sun exposure. So bats like it pretty warm in the summer. And then you don't want to use, you know, if you're building it yourself, you don't want to use treated wood for the parts that the bat will come into contact with. So you might want to use like a wooden post that's treated so that, um, you know, it doesn't rot. But the part that the bats are actually inside, you ideally use untreated wood for. Again, Bat Conservation International has a ton of great resources for this. And then if you are able to keep dead trees up, um, they're great for all kinds of wildlife. Um, you know, bats or tree roosting bats will get up under the peeling bark of trees and um, lots, you know, birds and stuff will use dead trees as well. And then during this time of social distancing, one of the ways that we're trying to collect more data is using our online roost form. So you can check that out on our website, www.illinoisbats.org. This includes if you know of um, a bat house or maybe bats are roosting in a picnic shelter or something like that on um, a local park property or something like that, or, you know, if bats are using your barn, attic, your friend's barn, um, we would really appreciate you filling out this roost form and we will usually <laughs> follow up and get back in touch with you about it. And with that, you know, thank you so much to Fermilab for having us um, do our project on your property and for inviting me to do this talk. Um, PIs on the project, Mark Davis and Steve Taylor. And then we've had a ton of field assistance with our work, including MISNET help and field technicians, which have been very helpful. And with that, I can take questions. You can see my contact info is there if you're on Twitter. Um, and then this is a picture I took in a cave a couple years ago, and I like to show it every Valentine's Day. These two bats cozied up together. <laughs> Thanks. That was that was great. I learned a lot, Tara. So great. we have we have a lot of great questions. Okay. Uh, let me get started with uh, Neil asked, um, "Can bats be shooed away from wind turbines by sonic irritants or the like?" So this is something that's being studied. Um, I was at a conference a couple years ago and they had put a sound deterrent on the wind turbine and they put it towards the back. And what happened was the bats were actually avoiding the back of the turbine and getting hit in the front. So now we're trying, you know, the sound deterrent facing forward. Um, but the issue the biggest issue with this kind of research is that those turbines are incredibly expensive and they're insured. And so the insurers don't want anything on top of the turbine or impacting the turbine. So it's really challenging to do that kind of research, but there's definitely a lot of effort going into trying different things. Um, I know they've tried putting lights on the ends of the blades, things like that to try to deter bats. So that's, that's something that um, some of the younger folks in our crowd, maybe when they, they grow up to be bat biologists, they can research that. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, another question, do different bat species coexist in the same hibernacula? And can you define that word for people that maybe are not familiar with it? Yeah, so the word hibernacula is actually really any place that bats are going in the winter to hibernate, to sleep in for the majority of the winter, 
and they're they're not just sleeping they're actually lowering their body metabolism so that they don't need to use a lot of calories that they don't need a lot of water and um so it's you know mines caves uh, warm attics things like that um, they're going to hibernate in those types of areas and as far as do they use the same places what's really neat is like when we go do a cave survey there will be like the southeastern bats and they're to kind of together and they're in a big clump and there's hundreds of them close together and then in another part of the cave there's the little brown bats and they're together and then the indiana bats so they're in the same cave but they actually kind of stick to their own little click um, which is interesting and i think it's just that they have different needs um, and so they they hang out in the the same areas within the cave can can you talk a little bit about where they roost when they're not hibernating i know you mentioned some uh like tree bark and things mm -hmm. like that yeah so some species will so the red bat for example you know it's trying to hang and look like a dead leaf and actually in the winter the red bats will go to southern illinois and they have a really furry Europatasium, so that's the, the skin near their tail. And they actually just curl up under the leaf litter for the winter, which is really cool. So each species is kind of doing their own thing. Um, the little brown bat, big brown, they really like barns. They've kind of adapted to, to using old barns. Um, and then, yeah, the Indiana bat, northern long-eared bat are really tree roosters they're looking for those big dead trees to get in either cracks crevices or under the bark great okay um going to your um research at fermi lab uh we have a question why is site 50 so much more active in the spring than in other seasons Oh yeah, so, sorry. I actually meant to change that to summer. So we went there at the end of our spring sampling. So it got categorized as spring, but it was really kind of that middle ground of late, I think we went in late May. So it really should probably be categorized as, as summer. And the reason there's so much activity is because it's a bat roost. So anytime we know where our roost location is we're going to get tons of data because those bats are coming out every night from the same location um you know it's not just bats flying in their normal foraging areas so it's any any roost you're going to get a ton of data all right um carol asked do owls eat bats so they can. Um, so bats, the reason they're, you know, people are always like, well, they don't have any predators. Why are they flying in the forest and they're afraid to go out into open areas? Um, but the smaller bats, yeah, they're avoiding open areas because they could get picked up by a hawk, an owl. Um, so they, yeah, they're, they're trying to avoid those kind of predators. Yeah, we had another question about predators uh, from Alexi. Oh, no, from, sorry, not sure who it was from, Neil. Um, how do cats encounter bats? Uh, you listed that as keeping your cats indoors as an important. Mm -hmm. um, and do bats walk along the ground? So generally a bat isn't going to be on the ground. They have a really hard time taking off flying again from the ground. Sometimes, you know, maybe they hit something and they fall on the ground, but generally you're not going to find a bat on the ground. But you know they're going to fly somewhat low to the ground to pick up insects and um you know it's the same with birds you know it seems like cats shouldn't be able to get a flying animal but they do um so i think bats birds they're flying somewhat close to the ground and the cat jumps up and, and grabs them or you know the cat climbs up a tree i'm not I'm, i've never seen it happen i just know that it does happen um so yeah um yeah okay all right um uh, now that the question from alexi can bats work together so there's a lot of speculation about this that's a great question actually 
Um, so when we're doing an emergence count is when, okay, so when we catch a bat, and it's a species of interest, we can attach a little radio transmitter. And the next day we go and try to find where that bat is spending the day. So where is its day roost? And we use these antennas to find them. Then we find the tree that this bat is roosting in. And then that night we will sit outside at sunset and watch the bats fly out so that we can count how many bats are using this roost. And when we're doing that, it's really neat because bats will sometimes fly out and they don't go very far and they fly back in and then they fly out, fly back in. And from some acoustic recordings, we do think that they have some social calls. So they're not their typical echolocation calls. It's something different. People believe it's a social call and maybe it's saying, hey, you know, the weather's great out here. Come on out. Or no, it's really windy. You don't want to go out there. Um, and we do know that vampire bats, which are not in the United States, down in Mexico, um, they will help their other, you know, roost friends to help them find food. Okay. Um, Kristen asks, uh, what do you do when you catch a bat? And I would add, um, how do you keep yourself safe from potential diseases from bats. Mm -hmm. So we are all pre-vaccinated for rabies. And then I typically wear golf gloves because they're pretty thin, but still leather. Um, most of the bats, I hope the photo showed that, you know, bats are pretty small. So it's, they're not typically able to bite through the glove. Um, but yeah, when we catch them, we're just really carefully taking off that netting and get the data we need and then we kind of let them go um they're not easy by any means to to get out of a net and they don't enjoy the experience but um a lot of times when we go to let them go they just sit in your hand and are like well you're actually kind of warm so it's okay <laughs> all right I um, there's a second part to that question um but what do you do when you catch the bat? Oh, and then also I wanted to say with coronavirus now, we have to wear an N95 and that's actually so that we don't give our local bats coronavirus. Um, so it's actually, we're the, the ones we have to worry about. Um, we have a question from Maureen. Do you have a favorite bat? <laughs> so my go-to favorite is in... Illinois is the little brown bat. I think it's the underdog. It doesn't have protection, but we're not catching it very much anymore. And I, I'm really worried about the little brown. Um, and Russell asked, what's the best way to see and view bats? So yeah, I get asked a lot, like what's the best thing we can do to, to learn about bats? And I always say in the summer, you know, go outside a few minutes before sunset. And just, I think people just don't look up enough. Um, in my backyard, I see bats all the time, but I'm looking for them. So, you know, look outside, go for a walk, go for a walk in the park right at sunset. A lot of times you will see bats if you're looking for them. So even when I'm leaving the grocery store, I'm looking up to see if there's bats around the light posts and things like that. And is there a, so that would be more in the, the spring and and summer and fall, not this time of year, right? No, not this. They're cuddled up all warm right now. Um, yeah, so you have to wait probably April and May is when you start to see bats. But, um, you know, in the summertime, you're going to see a lot more. Once the mosquitoes get going, then you're going to see a lot more bats. Okay. Okay, Kurt asks, could one have su success with a bat house mounted on the trunk of a tall tree? You said bat houses should receive sun exposure, but bats also live in trees, so. Yeah, so this is, you know, sometimes the recommendations seem um, strange. So we know that bats use trees, but for some reason, bat houses on trees don't seem as successful. And this is really, you know, reading papers and, you know, they're just looking at data that people have submitted. And it seems like 
it's not as successful and I'm not sure why I can't give you a good reason why um, but yeah for some reason they don't seem as successful but I have to say I've done a lot of outreach and people tell me all the time that they have a bat house that is in an area that's not recommended and it's full of bats so you know there's always exceptions to the rule I had a bad house for years and never had a bat in it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, that's not what, that's, it's, you know, it's not my go-to usually to recommend people just because I always like to say, you know, if someone built a house next to your house that wasn't quite as good, would you move all your stuff into that house? So, you know, bats are going to prefer typically their natural habitat. The, you know, if, unless they're evicted from a roost, you know, a tree falls down or someone closes up their attic, they're not necessarily looking for a new roost. So that wouldn't be at the top of your list of how to, to protect bats and. No, I know people feel good about bat houses and I have a bat house, but um, you know, I think there's other things you can do that um, probably have a bigger impact. Okay. Um, we have, a couple more questions, but keep them coming. We have a few more minutes if anybody has any further questions. But uh, Kathleen asks, at night, how can you tell if it's a bat or a bird? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it really takes experience of just, and not like you have to be a scientist, but just that you are out and you're looking regularly um, the one thing I can say is that bats seem a lot more erratic because they're looking for insects and they're kind of, is it that way, is it that way, and the insect is trying to evade them. So I do think bats have a little bit more, you know, they look a little crazier when they're flying because the, the birds that are out that get confused a lot for bats are swifts because they are pretty um, agile. Um, so. I also kind of take into context the area. So if it's a lot of old buildings, swifts, chimney swifts tend to be, you know, in old buildings. If you're out in a park, then bats might be a little bit more likely. Um, getting back to your uh, bat house, Helen is curious, do you have any bats in your bat house? <laughs> No, but we just got it. So um, we just moved into our new house. So um, hopefully this spring or summer they'll find it. But we do. So we have trees. We have a creek in the backyard. So, you know, I think we have good habitat for, for bats. And I've done acoustic recordings in our backyard and we have tons of bats. So I'm hoping it will be successful. But I'm also happy if they have, if they have, like, if you're not if your bat house isn't being used, that's actually a great sign because that means bats have enough natural habitat and they're not looking for, for something new. Great. Um, so are there any open science or citizen scientist projects to collect and map bat calls? So there, uh, Lincoln Park Zoo does some um, citizen science activities up in the Chicagoland area and some of the county like Kane County I think is working on some too we have a little Illinois bat biologist club and um, there are some projects I would reach out to your county um, natural resources departments and ask if they're um, doing anything or if you're closer to Chicago you can contact Lincoln Park Zoo Um, Carol asks, when do bats have their young? So bats are really cool because they mate in the fall and then they have delayed fertilization because they can't be pregnant during the winter when they're hibernating and migrating and have these, you know, extensive energetic needs. Um, so they mate in the fall, delayed fertilization until spring, then they're pregnant. And around in Illinois, bats are typically having their young in late June and then they're flying a few like a month later. Um, then 
getting back to the citizen, citizen scientist projects, um, mm -hmm. can you do acoustic recording yourself or do you need professional equipment? So that's the other thing, you know, the equipment is typically very expensive. So one of our recorders can be over a thousand dollars. However, there's been some really cool new inventions. So I actually have one right here. This is what I use in my backyard sometimes. Um, this is by the company called Wildlife Acoustics, and it's just a little attachment for your iPhone or um, iPad, and it's a little microphone. It plugs into your charge cord, <laughs> oops, um, and it comes with a free program that's going to try to analyze the species as you're recording. If you do decide to get one of these, I recommend getting a painter pole or something tall, and then you can get an extension cable so you can actually get it higher up. Um, another option is there's something called audio moths and they're about $50 and those you can leave out at night um, and record overnight. This thing you you know you're not gonna leave your phone out overnight. This is something you can just actively record. Um, Did you say audio moths? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. And um, if you are interested in doing recordings, you can shoot me an email um, and I can, I can give you more information too. All right. Um, we have a few more minutes. So if anyone has a last question, um, I wanted to ask, how did you get involved with bat biology? Yeah, um, so I, I'm typing my email in there. Um, so I graduated from Winona State in Minnesota with an environment. Park service, things like that. And when I would show up, they would say, oh, by the way, we need help with bat surveys. Sorry, my connection went down. For I was going to say, it just told me that the connection was unstable. So sorry if that didn't go through, but um, I just kind of en kept ending up experiencing working with bats kind of randomly. So um, once I held a bat and realized how small and adorable I think they are, uh, I was kind of hooked. And then, you know, there's so much we don't know, which is kind of the best part about science is discovering new things. So. Um, where do young bats live while they are maturing? So when the females create these maternity colonies, they can either um, leave their young in the maternity colony and they'll go out and forage. The mothers don't go as far um, as they usually would. They, you know, they're not going to go very far if they leave their young behind. Sometimes the mother will take the young with her. It will just clutch to her, the front of her. Um, and then, you know, they can fly pretty, I mean, I, th I think it seems pretty soon because they're tiny and hairless little things when they're first born. It's amazing that they can fly within, you know, four or six weeks. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tara. This was really interesting look into the bats in our area, and I'm sure you've inspired some people to learn more and do what they can to protect the bats. So thanks so much. And thanks to everyone who joined us this afternoon. Um, you can join us again this evening for our Iron Scientist competition at 7.30. And you can still sign up at our website, fnal.gov, where you can find additional programming and educational resources. We look forward to seeing you at Fermilab when we are once again open to the public. Thanks. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining me today.